you very much, Debbie. Um, I'm now going to welcome our third speaker, Lawrence Williams. Justin, could you do? Lawrence Williams is Associate Professor of French and Applied Linguistics. He's also the coordinator of the Arabic program and Associate Chair for the Department of World Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at the University of North Texas. His research is centered around new technologies as tools for teaching and learning and communication in educational and non-educational contexts. He's the co-editor of a recent Calico monograph, Digital Literacies in Foreign and Second Language Education, that just came out um, this year in 2014. His research examines discourse produced by learners and native speakers, and he draws a lot from corpus-driven studies of sociolinguistic and pragmatic di dimensions of language with a specific focus on electronic French discourse. His talk for us today is titled Rethinking Communicative Competence for Digital Spaces. And I think he's ready, you ready? Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Williams. <laughs> the, the lapel one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the, um, the idea here is to look a bit beyond communicative competence, which we've heard about for decades and decades. Um, the most recent model, having been um, proposed by Celso Murcia a few years ago, with all of these um, different parts of what kind of looks like a compass, you would have discourse competence in the middle, as kind of the main thing, you have to understand, for example, you know, what makes a poem a poem? What makes a novel a novel? What makes the service encounter at the Starbucks drive through a service encounter of that type? Uh, linguistic and formulaic competence would be the west and east points of the compass as counterbalances. We have linguistic competence would be everything in the language, and then formulaic competence would be uh, something like, you know, salt and pepper, these are things that go together, uh, bread and butter, um, or, for example, how to do greetings. They're always done the same way, and you just do them that way. So, you know, they're part of linguistic competence, but they're done in a certain way. That's why she kind of puts them together. Sociocultural competence and interactional competence would be the north and south points of the compass kind of as counterbalances to each other, sociocultural, of course, being something like register, formality, informality, but then interactional competence being um, knowing speech acts and how to use them and when to use them. So then you have this kind of arrow that goes through everything around the circle, it's strategic competence, knowing what to do when communication fails or knowing how to avoid communication breakdowns. And I'm sure you're at least familiar with some of the parts of this already because they've all been uh, proposed in models since the 70s and 80s. Um, the main problem that some people have, um, Claire Kromsch being one of them who has proposed a supplement, is that this is often reduced to spoken uh, communication. And that, of course, was a big emphasis in the 1980s um, when we, people were kind of, you know, it's like moving from one end to the other. Everything was very grammar translation. Then by the 80s and 90s, everything's about speaking and making sure they can at least speak. And then people forget a little bit about um, writing or reading. Not totally, but a little bit. So then uh, we go beyond uh, communicative competence. If we accept Kromsch's suggestion to use symbolic competence as a supplement. So the main reason why I think this is important is it goes beyond actual adjective endings and the subjunctive and all of those things we know. It's just really easy to do in class all of the time if you just want to do grammar. Um, so what is symbolic competence? Well, it's understanding the symbolic value of symbolic forms and the different cultural memories evoked by different symbolic systems. Um, then we have, of course, another part of it is drawing on semiotic diversity. This is all about multiple languages, uh, multi, mul the multilingual subject, of course, as she writes about in her book. Even though we often focus on you know, one language at a time, she kind of sees the world as this place where many languages coexist, even, that, even if that's not how the educational system is set up. 
All right? In other words, um, we don't talk about Spanish in the French classroom. We don't talk about Arabic in the German classroom. I'm talking about traditionally or typically. Uh, right? I'm not talking about some progressive people who might be doing some great things. But you know, then again, the students have certain expectations too. So if we did start going all multilingual in the classroom, it might seem strange because of the way our educational system is set up. We have a third part of symbolic competence. So this is looking at both at and through language and to understand the challenges to the autonomy and integrity of the subject. So it's really about um, how do you as an individual, as a learner, as a teacher, as the multilingual subject, how do you negotiate the different spaces where different languages are used and is that uh, really uh, what we should be helping students to do instead of kind of reducing competence to this thing where Yes, you know how to buy a stamp at the post office and you could order an iced tea or a lemonade at the cafe well, or coffee, or et cetera. So we have something else, uh, the implication. So this actually um, results in the production of complexity. Instead of trying to see language always as some set of rules that you can memorize and maybe there are a few exceptions, we have to recognize that it's going to be more complex and we can't just go through our language sequence saying, oh, well, I've made it to the third year, so I'm almost fluent or I'm almost competent or whatever you want to call it. Uh, different people will learn different things at different times because of the complexity of language. Then we have to, of course, help students understand that it's okay if there is ambiguity. Um, and this goes back to the classic, well, you know, I found this word in the dictionary and so, you know, you're marking it wrong. Well, yes, and let's talk about why. And even if you don't understand why, maybe someday you will. <laughs> or you can just accept the ambiguity, right? <laughs> we also have form as meaning, so looking not just at words themselves, but how things are designed, arranged, and colors, and the grammar of visual design, etc. So, um, and you might have noticed that that goes back to the 2006 article, which was part of the um, Modern Language Journal. They have kind of a, a discussion with several different perspectives on the same issue. And so this is where Kromsch had first proposed the notion of symbolic competence as a supplement to communicative competence. Um, the other reference, 2009, is to the book. So we have, you know, what else does this imply? Well, just as a reminder, we have different codes different physical materials or modes, and then, of course, different media. Um, these kind of going from, you know, communicative competence, symbolic competence, into thinking about how things have changed in digital communication or digital spaces, I really want to focus on these four dimensions. Um, the, the problem we have here, of course, is that some of it is new, some of it is old, some of it is somewhere in between. So obviously when I talk about design, uh, a lot of it will be related to physical space as well as digital space. So design is, has uh, become much more important for anyone um, who's considered the, uh, fr the pedagogical framework of the New London Group. Uh, which is based on this notion of multiliteracies. So we have the available designs. These are all the resources we have at our disposal, meaning not just language, but also color and shapes and font size and on and on. We have the designing, which is the process of shaping emergent meaning, right? So this includes representation re and recontextualization. And then we have the redesigned. So this, of course, is not only for words, but also other symbols and other um, spaces or anything that we design. So in, wait, I have the number in parentheses, so we'll have a series of these that look at design. 
Well, so how is design somewhat different? And you've all seen a web page, so you know that it's different somehow, but um, I think we often forget that just because students have seen web pages so many times that they don't actually stop to think about how this is different or how it's similar to whatever else they may know. So the whole idea here is to say, well, let's look at every part of the page and realize that someone has designed this in a certain way for a purpose. And it may not be designed in such a way that the user actually uses it how it was intended to be used, but we can kind of try to figure out how people use it and how it was designed by someone to be used. And it's okay if they don't match, right? So right away we notice this, you know, commande just means order. So if you live in Canada or near Canada, you know that Saint-Hubert is a restaurant. So obviously they're promoting the you know, delivery service during the hockey match specifically, right? Because this you know, order button is not there at all times of day. So what we realize right away is that there's this you know, idea of temporality where you're going to have one page during the hockey match, but then everything's going to change. It's not like the newspaper, right? La Presse is a news company. It's not like the newspaper where they're going to send out a special edition with the phone number of Saint-Hubert you know, to sell to people just during the hockey match. This is just not even possible. So we have one thing about temporality going on here. We also see that there's this word publicité just above Club Med. That means advertisement. So uh, we're now to the point in Canada where advertisements have to be marked and we'll notice later that they don't always have to be marked, but in this particular spot on the web page, they have to be marked. Okay, let's continue. Um, so we have Saint Hubert kind of everywhere. Um, they are, you know, once again marked here because this is the like this is a little bit lower on the page than the top, and plus it happens to be right next to a news story. Um, so. Right, of course, in a traditional classroom, you would learn, oh, and the students would all be impressed that they have pulled pork in Canada also. But if you go beyond this, it's, you know, the, the symbolic competence is, well, we've seen the same symbol before, Saint-Hubert. We know Coca-Cola is the same internationally. Um, what is this, you know, poutine? Um, why is the publicité marked there? You could go on quite a bit. You could then even go to the Saint-Hubert website because this is all connected uh, somehow because it's on the web. Now we see a similar page where the Workopolis at the top actually is not um, indicated as an advertisement because it's okay if it's up there because no one expects the news to be above the main navigation bar. It's just, it's understood by people. It's when it's below the main navigation bar where it has to be indicated as an advertisement so that it's not confused with the news. And so once again, these are just examples of design and it would kind of be up to you and your students to figure out what the implications of all this might be. So another element of design, we have the use of color. We see the use of yellow in the top twice Right, so we have advertisement uh, in the middle, and then we have the privacy policy. So the Hershey Corporation decided to use yellow as the color for their kind of legal information, and I just clicked on it to see what it would actually tell me. And it's this policy they have that if the site tries to sell things, they want you to know. So that's why it's linked to the privacy policy. Right, so symbolic competence, once again, is looking at the design, I mean part of it, it's not just all of it, looking at the design, seeing what you can figure out about the layout, the colors, the positioning of things, the type of fonts, the different areas of the website. So really we're talking about a type of literacy um, in a digital space. Then we have uh, this use of color, which can be very important. As we all know, green represents certain things. 
strangely enough, um, after one hour of trying to learn more, I couldn't find anything about how the tires were contributing to sustainability. <laughs> but I, I think it was more about the use of the color and showing us the tire and making sure we knew as the potential consumer that they would be doing something for sustainability. Um, another element of design, of course, was once again with color, but it's also with the certain symbols. We have the R in uh, the circle there. This is the kind of thing that would typically be ignored in the classroom. However, the use of R and the use of TM in English happen to be very important to companies, right? So this is linked to economics and marketing and advertising, et cetera. It's, it's beyond the scope of the actual language being used, but th these symbols and figuring out the legal implications of the use of these symbols um, could be something that help students understand like, you know, the, the broader uh, scheme of things and other advertisements they see or other corporate documents that they may encounter. Okay, so then we'll go on to linearity. Two simple points to make here. Uh, different communicative paths are available, and then different communicative paths are viewable. So once again, we all may think that students understand this, but we're not sure, I guess. So if this is um, up to you, really, to decide how much of this you would want to do with your students. So here we have these, um, right? We all know there are different communicative paths available. We have one, like several in the social information zone. I wrote the thing, the black uh, letters there. And then the product information zone, we can actually see what they sell. And then the legal information zone, right? These are all of the communicative paths that are just on the last couple of inches on the bottom of their page. You can imagine all of the other things they have on the top of their page. <laughs> okay, so we have, once again, Buick, part of the General Motors, uh, brands, well, obviously the multiple paths, right? So here, then, uh, we have some paths are viewable and some are not. This actually represents, I think, seven or eight messages, but if you're only looking at the actual feed uh, of the Twitter account, you won't see what's represented in the orange box is actually, I, I did a screen capture of just four of them, but that's actually all hidden. Okay, so once again, design indexicality. Um, well, sorry about the quality of this, but in red boxes, you have the form, the vu form in French, and in yellow, you have a form of tu, right? So it's like, you know, same in Spanish with like tu and vos, and then you would have the usted and um, other ustedes, right? So yellow on some, but red on the others. Well, in lexicality, uh, there aren't really any consequences to this. If you did this to a person when you were talking to them and you're switching, you know, oh, okay, now it's been two minutes, I'm gonna switch back to, you know, the re, the vu. Now I'm gonna switch back to chu before I go back to a whole thing of vu with you. There would be actual social consequences, but because of this, you know, this being in a digital space, someone will fill out the form and they're probably not going to mention to the company, by the way, you know, I don't know how you're treating me or how you're viewing me, right? Or how you're in indexing me as a person or a customer, but we have the same thing, carombar. In black, you have vous. In blue, you have two forms. So you see it switches throughout the page. And Nike, same thing, yellow versus red. You have the mix. And these are just a few sites in French. I've also found, like even you know, Coca-Cola, Costa Rica, they were switching between tu and vos. So, of course, you probably wouldn't do that with a person you were talking to, but there are no social consequences really here. Um, the other notion is that um, you know, indexicality can be cultural. So we have three important colors here, white, green, and red. But this can also, of course, be in the physical um, linguistic landscape also. This is just kind of a, once again, a, a quick um, overview. So we get to interaction, which is the last of the four points that I'm talking about. 
and we'll look at interaction in digital spaces. I would encourage you to read Herring's classification scheme because it really provides you with um, about 20 different factors, half technological and half social, as the initial step for doing any kind of uh, real like close examination or exploration of electronic, computer mediated discourse. Um, and so the question always is why begin with a classification scheme because that is often seen as the way to do an accurate description of discourse well as interaction and then you can figure out what kind of analysis you want to do based on the data that you've been looking at. And so this is just to give you an idea of the factors here. Um, Herring has uh, really done a survey of all of the computer mediated discourse research to see what different factors people have looked at. So she's kind of compiled the list based on the existing research, and these are just the technological factors that are influenced by the medium. And then you have, of course, the social factors that are influenced by the, the situation itself. And obviously language is down here in you know, norms and code, but there are um, so many other things besides just language that are happening in this type of discourse. So I have two main concluding remarks. Um, so once again, today's learners might not or might be intimidated by new digital tools and spaces, but they will need at least some help from you. And by you, I'm talking to teachers and I guess parents and whoever, uh, as they explore the affordances of these tools and spaces. Because obviously, we can't imagine everything they might want to do or could do with digital tools and spaces. And I really like the um, the idea here from this slogan that they had in the Google Chrome advertisement is the web is what you make of it because any of these tools or any of these spaces it's it's just like the website um, that we saw the first example of design we don't know how someone will use it but there are many thing, many ways you could use it so I hope you'll remember those two things thank you We're going to transition ever so slightly. We're all going to move up here for the roundtable discussion, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A as well.